Fatima. Tom, the issue with the, with the global indices, is it the issue uh, theoretically around the indices or is it the lack of data? That's I think if you had, let's think about Living Planet Index, which is based on population trends. If you had detailed population studies from lots and lots and lots and lots of species, well distributed across all the landscapes of interest, then it would be a very interesting thing to look at. But if you think about where those studies are being done, it's going to be lots and lots and lots of information from some parts of the world and very little information from the rest. So I think in that case, it's a data thing. You could, you could make some problems about what population trends in vertebrates mean. For example, um, we have two uh, gallinaceous birds near where I live. If greater prairie chickens are doing this, which they are, it's very bad. That's a, a keystone species, a flagship species of our prairies. But if ring-necked pheasants go like this, it's actually bad for everybody. Okay? One, they are nest parasites, brood parasites. Uh, they're an indicator of, of disturbance, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to just you know, ask, is the slope negative? but rather I want some sort of weighting based on how much I like that species from a biodiversity perspective versus dislike it, okay? In terms of the red list index, I mean, think of the comments Les made about it. Um, it has to be coarse resolution. It just has to be. It depends on expert knowledge. It's not data-driven. It's not repeatable. It's not scalable. It's not extendable. So I think there you have a real essential problem with the index. OK? There's another point as well. I think, I think the, um, the economists have kind of stolen a march on us. So we can talk about um, global indices of the economy and you know so we, we go through an economic downturn and there's an, there are numbers attached to that and uh, and they communicate but somehow we haven't got it right in the biodiversity world to come up with with the, with mm -hmm. the equivalent mm -hmm. to that so the stock market index is is fine and it tells you how the economy is or the stock market as a whole has gone but it's always um, um, followed by those shares which have kicked the trend. Right, exactly. And so, so there's, there's, uh, it's, it's unpacked right. in, a, in, a, in a very useful way. Right. And we've never managed to actually right. quite, you know, right. say, you know, birds in South Africa are doing this. Right. And these are the exceptions to the, to the trend. Yeah. And I, I wish we could. I do too. Uh, I think the IPBES phenomenon is going to be very educational about that. In terms of economy, it really comes down to you know, how fat is your wallet or how fat is somebody's wallet. And so it's really one currency or a, a small set of currencies. You know, it may be taking into account how much you're saving or it may be just how much you're spending. Um, but it really is a fairly simple phenomenon. I know the economists would be horrified at my saying that. Biodiversity is not. And IPBES, you saw that first slide, laid out these wonderful broad statements about how you know, the planet's biodiversity, ecosystems, and ecosystem function are critical and crucial and blah, 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 blah. But when they have to make a list of the essential biodiversity variables, things that they can measure, boom, they pull way back. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't say I was going to do all tax on biodiversity inventories for spots all over the world. All I'm going to do is stuff that I can measure from a satellite. You know, forget about species of sipunculid worms or staphylinid beetles. I'm just going to look at 
net pr primary productivity and land use conversion and things like that. And so what they did was they were trying to, at the outset, in the marketing stage, they were trying to take on a hugely multidimensional phenomenon. And then when it came time to define that work program, what you're actually going to do, now that you did your marketing, they cut it way back to things that are doable. I mean... So you say so you're... Um I was, I was hoping that you were going to make the point with your otters in Denmark was that the, uh, the numbers went from 40 to 80 or something like that. That's puffling numbers, right? Yeah. It's hardly, hardly a data set which ought to go into an index yeah. like that. It's meaningless. Meaningless, yes. Yeah. So, um, otters on the edge of their range Right. In a place where it's warming and those animals are going to be increasing anyway. So right. It's not a good thing. Right. Yeah, I, another very good point. So, let's go back to the, this idea of biodiversity status metrics. The metrics that we've seen so far are global in scope, limited in detail, and useless when you want to go to some smaller extent. We do have, as we've been talking about for the last couple days, pretty massive stores of primary biodiversity data. It's not a data deluge, but there's a lot out there, right? <laughs> Those data, for some taxa and for some regions, and more taxa and more regions with every year or five years or 10 years that go by, they can, those data exist to support rich, detailed analyses at smaller extents. And so really the challenge is creative, intelligent, flexible, agile implementation of biodiversity, informatics, data, tools, and frameworks. So at the outset of this course, just before the outset of this course, I sent each of you a data file. And some of those data files are pretty darn big. The biggest was South Africa, and it was really big. Um, Kenya was pretty big. We're going to show you guys some images of, of the, the Kenyan data set. And in other cases, well, both the countries are smaller and the data are smaller. Okay, and that's to be expected. And maybe, you know, to be able to do some really cool stuff in West Africa, maybe Benin and Ghana should team up. Right? Maybe that's a, more of a critical mass. West Africa rather than, than uh, these countries that are kind of a coast to interior transect, right? Um, the data exists. The DRC, I sent you a really small file, Jean. But there's a museum full of data up there in Tervuren where as that museum full of data is captured, that can be the basis for a lot of intelligent, exciting work across your country. So um, this body of work that Jorge and I and others have been, have been exploring, the point is obviously we need more data. Obviously we need better tools, better thinking, more people thinking. But in many cases, and for some taxa, there's enough to get started. And there's kind of no excuse for sitting back and saying, well, um, at least IUCN is working on it. No. Take your destiny into your own hands. Okay? So just a little bit of, of kind of illustration of those last few points. Um, 
and says, Evolution of the Knowledge of the Biodiversity of Mexico. Um, and what you see is over time, from 1550 to 2000, the number of species that had been described. Okay? And so we see these, you know, the Codice Florentino and the work of Francisco Hernandez. These are people who had to uh, speak in Aztec to be able to do their work, right? Hernandez. The Codex Florentino is written in, in the Aztec languages. Um, we get Linnaeus appearing here in the middle 1700s, and then you see this upward trajectory. Uh, vertebrates go like this, and arthropods go like this, and microorganisms are always lagging behind. Um, but you can see kind of the, the great era of biodiversity description, at least for macrobiodiversity. Um, we get to the point where here for amphibians, we've got these really nice uh, models of present day species diversity and how that species diversity can evolve over coming, coming decades. Um, and Mexico, which has done an amazing job with in-country exploration and prioritization. Um, Mexico just published a really neat gap analysis, four volumes, I believe. Um, but essentially, they're taking massive stores of biodiversity data that they've accumulated. This is Conabio, OK? They're analyzing those data, and they're saying, basically, across Mexico, what are, under these explicit criteria, using these workflows, what are the conservation priorities for terrestrial biodiversity and freshwater aquatic biodiversity? There's tons and tons and tons of maps like this. And along with that goes use. So here's, here's Conabio's uh, data server. It's called Remib. Back in the 90s, they were just getting started. Here's where that NABIN effort started getting off the ground. And, and Chris and Jorge and I and others were, were playing with serving data more and more. And you can see it goes into this J growth phase where it just goes boom, exponential growth. And literally, now between two and three million accesses to their data stores per month. Okay? And that comes out of pairing the data with the information products. Okay, transparent, quantitative, real data-driven information products paired with the primary data. So, conclusions. Uh, how many times am I going to say this? Okay, biodiversity information. Oh, look at that, there's Jorge. Uh, biodiversity information products have been focused at the global level. There are a lot of opportunities for creative use of the data. These new products can respond to all sorts of needs. Okay, it doesn't just have to be biodiversity conservation. Why do we always say the same thing, right? What about if it were, you know, sustainable inhabitant, uh, inhabitants of landscapes? We may be an agency, an initiative, a group that's just worried about invasive alien species. And maybe we don't care about the status of the vertebrate that perches on that invasive plant. We just want to get rid of those invasive alien plants. Well, we can design our own metrics. The red list index and the, and the living planet index and things like that are irrelevant. We can de design our own information products, and they can speak to our own needs at any extent for which there's enough data. And essentially, it just requires activity at sub-global extents. 
it also requires capacity, human capacity, infrastructural capacity at those same extents. Again, you guys take care of your needs because nobody else will.